This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. I'm pleased to welcome you all to this uh, fifth lecture in this year's Gifford Lecture Series, being given by our distinguished colleague, Professor Diana Eck from Harvard University. Last night was a fascinating uh, survey of a number of voices of so-called Abrahamic religions speaking to the question of religious pluralism. And this evening, she continues in sort of part two, dealing, I think, more with Far Eastern versions of religiosity and how they have engaged uh, the, the subject of religious pluralism. Will you join me in welcoming her and uh, inviting her now to give this, this lecture? Thank you very much. Asia. Asia has long been the home of many religious traditions. And two of them, the Hindu and the Buddhist traditions, challenge those of us who are Western monotheists. The Hindu tradition with its profusion of gods and images of the divine, 330 million of them, so they say. And the Buddhist tradition, which has no need for the term god or gods at all, or the notions that accompany them. These rich and extensive spiritual traditions cast into the teapot of cultural provincialism all the discussion of whether God is dead or not, or God is back or not. So it's worth today beginning in Asia as we think about religious difference and the encounters of the age of pluralism. All of Asia experienced the impact of colonialism with its economic and military power, its overwhelming cultural presence, and the deep religious and ideological tsunamis that accompany the might of empire. Asia is familiar with religious and ideological difference and has, on the whole, developed distinctive approaches to the problem of difference. Gandhi put it bluntly when he said, all religions are true a catchy claim in which both an understanding of religion and an understanding of truth are embedded. What he meant by that, of course, must be seen in the context of the multi multiple religious streams converging, diverging of India's religious life. They are, as Gandhi put it metaphorically, like rivers of faith, all of which run to the ocean. They're like the many branches of the same tree, the siblings of the same family, the roads along which we travel, all religions are not the same, to be sure. All are imperfect. They, quote, constitute a revelation of truth, but are not, quote, the truth. For religious traditions are human responses to the glimpses we have of the divine. They are human creations, thus they are imperfect. There are ways of being, our paths of seeking, our communities of familial belonging. They all have their distortions their times of darkness and their violence and their fanaticism. Gandhi had much to say about religion and religious diversity, all of it grounded in the crucible of his own experience in the religiously and racially divided worlds of India, England, and South Africa. As a rule of thumb, he adopted the attitude sarva dharma samanatva, the equal regard for all religions, all dharmas. And dharma, as you may know, is the closest term we have to, quote, religion. But we have to note that it could equally be translated as law or ethics or right action or even ritual. We touched upon this term in talking about the meanings of pluralism in the Indian nation. For this term, sarva dharma samanatva, is also what is used to translate secularism in the Indian Constitution. Equal regard is what grows from sympathetic knowledge, the knowledge that others experience a sense of community, inspiration, vision from their own tradition that must be analogous to what we experience in ours. This imaginative capacity to regard appreciatively a perspective we do not share is what makes us human. It doesn't mean adopting the other religion, but it does, as Gandhi put it, quote, compel me to understand their viewpoint, to appreciate the light in which they look upon their religion. And his rule of thumb was to attempt to understand another tradition in the eyes of the faithful, 
through the lives of those who have lived it. Gandhi was preoccupied with what he called the truth, with a capital T, I suppose, we could put it that way, which for him was another word for what some of us might mean by God, with a capital G, or Tillich's ultimate reality, with a capital U-R. No capitals in Sanskrit, but the term is sat, S-A-T, being, being alone, one of the very few words that can point toward the ultimate reality, toward Brahman, transcendence in the face of which all language and speech fall away. That, of course, is the meaning of transcendence. It always exceeds and transcends our ability to understand it. It stretches beyond our imagination. No one encircles it. It is not a possession, but a constant goal. Indeed, one sure sign that one is losing track of the truth is the claim to have an exclusive possession of it. Revelation, writes Gandhi, is the exclusive property of no nation, no tribe. Gandhi's India is the homeland of Buddhism, which flourished for over 1,500 years from the time of the Buddha in the 6th century BCE until about the 11th century. It's the home of Jain monks and nuns and laity, which began about the same tradition, time as the Buddhist tradition did and continues to flourish today. The Christian tradition also has ancient roots in India where Christians trace their origin to the Apostle Thomas. And the Jews have an old community started by traders in the southern state of Kerala in Bombay. And the Parsis are followers of the Zoroastrian tradition with its roots in what is now Iran. And from the 11th century, the Muslim tradition took root in India and developed a distinctive Indo-Muslim culture Before the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947, about a third of all Indians were Muslims, and even now, about 12%. And finally, the Sikh tradition began in northwest India in the 16th century with the teachings of Guru Nanak and has evolved into a vibrant and distinctive religious community. Many Hindus would say today that the context in which all these traditions have lived in interrelation is basically a Hindu context, defined not by a creed, but by a broad ethos or worldview. Those people who call themselves Hindus today have many forms of practice. There are Shaivas, Shaktas, Vaishnavas, and many sub-fields of each one. On the whole, this Hindu context has been one of harmony and not conflict. The Hindu context has absorbed many a people and tradition, repeatedly affirming the integral oneness of reality and the multiple perceptions of that same reality. While Muslim, Sikh, and Christian communities have, at times, been adamant, insistent in distinguishing themselves from this broad contextual background, none has remained uninfluenced by it, by this context of palpable diversity. Despite the sectarian diversity, there are Hindu assumptions about life that do have common, if not universal, currency. That the universe is permeated with the divine, a reality often described as Brahman. That the divine is known in many names and forms. That this reality is deeply and fully present within the human soul. That the soul's journey to self-realization is not accomplished in a single lifetime, but takes many lifetimes that the soul's course through life after life is shaped by one's deeds, and that action, or karma, makes its imprint not only in the world, but in the complex psychophysical being of the actor. There is also a theological affirmation that is repeated over and over to underline the nature of this diversity. Ekam sat vipraha bahuda vadanti, truth or ultimate reality, Sat is one, though people speak of that one in many ways and attempt to realize it in their lives through many paths. In the U.S., the affirmation of oneness amid diversity has a sociological and political form. We touched on this in discussing America's e pluribus unum from many one in an earlier lecture. Or Indonesia's bineka tunggal ika, unity in diversity, also social, cultural, and political. But this Vedic affirmation of oneness that has been repeated 
some would say practically ad nauseum for 3,000 years now, while it may have colored the national sense of political pluralism, is not sociological or political, but theological. It's an affirmation about the very nature of ultimate reality, ekam sat, vipraha, bahuda vadanti, truth is one. And even the wise speak of it in many ways. We may say that it's a ready-made theology of pluralism, but you know, it's not so easy. Oneness does not subsume manyness. Diversity is real in our language and in our apprehension. Diversity glides and shimmers like the intricate movements of an Indian raga, disciplined by scale and rhythm, but created ever anew by each performance, by the inspired invocation of each artist. There's no other theme played so constantly, like a continuously evolving raga, a musical scale with a multitude of variations, and perhaps no culture on earth that has developed as complex an understanding of the nature of human and divine manyness as Hindu India. This general contextual solution to diversity that we might call Hindu has never been that of a melting pot nor a mosaic, but rather that of a kaleidoscope in which a multitude of distinct pieces continuously fall into different patterns over and over and over again with each twist of the wrist. Diversity is preserved and valued in a flexible dynamic pattern of interrelation. It is endlessly additive. It is what Nehru called a palimpsest, a layered, written over and over again manuscript without completely erasing what went before. Difference in this view is not a threat to oneness, but constitutive of oneness. The whole is made up of difference, its many parts not isolated but in interrelation. To say this is the one and only may be a marker of importance to other cultures, but Hindu India has long taken a different measure of the meaning of oneness and plurality. This plurality is also hierarchical the body that is divided into the whole of creation. This body is a hierarchical metaphor. There are feet and there are arms and there is a head. Radhakrishnan, a modern Hindu philosopher, Vedanta philosopher, one time Spalding professor at Oxford, affirms that what we might call Hinduism is not a definite dogmatic creed, but a vast, complex, subtly unified mass of spiritual thought and realization, as he puts it. The Hindu solution to the problem of diversity, if one defines it as a problem, is, quote, not a common creed, but a common quest, a spiritual quest. And how to speak about that common quest? Is it about belief? Is it about God? Well, not really at all. Surely the most important way of articulating it is the quest to discover our real nature, to discover the self, if we're to use that term, the quest to discover the real that not only undergirds the universe, but is at the heart of who we are as human beings. Atman, the soul. Quote, to recognize the diversity within, obscured as it is by our own lack of vision, our lack of compassion, the entangling bondage of our own action, our own making. The exploration of this inner terrain, while it has been the path of seekers in many religious traditions has long been highly developed in India. In Indic traditions, the whole range of them, Hindu, Jain, Buddhist, there are practices and paths and postures. There are physical and mental disciplines called yogas. There are meditative techniques for focusing and stilling the antics of the mind. And there are maps, so to speak, that track the experience of generations of inner pilgrims. There are realizations that many of the polarities of mind and body, physical and metaphysical, what we now call science and spirituality, are actually connected. The contribution of Indic thinking to religious pluralism is perhaps more than anything, the worldwide attention to a worldview that rests not on something revealed by God, but something discovered by humankind, a holistic universe that is intricately interrelated. Now, this surfeit of plurality in the Hindu tradition has posed a real challenge to Islam and Christianity. 
both of which have laid claim in some voice to uniqueness and finality. No such claim is really possible in this worldview. Even so, over the centuries, both Islam and Christianity have brought those claims to India, where they have been negotiated at the local level for centuries. Both Islam and Christianity have found a home in the Hindu context. However, today, those who articulate a Hindu view on religious pluralism often find themselves contending with new forms of Christian mission, namely new energetic evangelical media-rich mission, and new forms of Muslim fundamentalism. And not only that, but with new Hindu movements as well. Hindu movements that in their monolithic views of what has long been a complex tradition seem to imitate the fundamentalism and exclusivism of extremist Muslims and Christians. Those of you who have kept abreast of Hindu developments are well aware that in modern times, the Hindu nationalist movement has taken a kind of <clears throat> doctrinal and chauvinistic view of something it calls Hinduism, Hindutva, Hinduness. It seems to those of us who study India that these movements in, in some way have taken what is a multiform plural tradition and made it into something much more like a religion after the fashion of more boundary traditions of the West. This phenomenon is what some concerned Hindu thinkers, such as my colleague Vinadas, have called the Semiticization of Hinduism. That Hinduism must have a creed, a unity, even a worldwide organization, a structure that runs counter to the deeply diverse and pluralistic uh, traditions of Hinduism. As Veena wrote in the aftermath of November 1984 paroxysms of violence in Delhi, is it not ironic that at this stage of human history, we Hindus, who have been the inheritors of a great tradition of diversity, wish to define Hinduism as nothing more than a pale shadow of Semitic religions, the great value being placed upon homogeneity and oneness of the Hindus are the pangs of death rather than the rebirth of Hinduism. Just when the world stood in need of India's loosely Hindu pluralism, these Hindus have developed their own form of fanaticism. Its focus and symbol became the quest to pull down a 16th century mosque that was said to have been built upon the site of the birthplace of Lord Rama and build there a new temple to Rama. And in 1992, they succeeded. But one might take that as the symbol of this, somehow to, to peel away uh, everything that has gone over the last number of centuries to restore what might have been there 500 years ago. And of course, if we applied that principle to all of the great religious sites of the world, uh, we would have quite a mess. Anyway, these are issues that it's not really possible to analyze in this brief compass, but let's say that at times it seems to us that this venerable South Asian civilization of religious diversity is more fractured than anywhere in the world with its communal violence. But our pledge in these lectures is something different, and that is to listen for the voices and visions that show a way ahead, that show a way ahead in a world of religious diversity, and most important, to be sure, is the countless testimony of local alliances, of citizen groups, of public intellectuals who have resisted the politicization of religious identities in India. For all its 20th century episodes of communal violence, India continues to supply countless examples of the creativity of shared cultural and religious life. The lanes and gullies of Hindu Banaras, for example, one finds in them dozens of Muslim saint shrines and martyr shrines. When one of my Harvard undergraduates, Rowena Potts, set out to do a senior thesis there, she found a Muslim shrine with a Hindu caretaker, honored by both Hindus and Muslims, a reality widely duplicated in India and amply du duplicated if even in the great Hindu pilgrimage place of Benares. Even when a bomb exploded in 2006 in the beloved Sankat Mochan Temple in Benares, as horrific as that event was, it failed to trigger the reverberations of communal violence that its perpetrators intended. Indeed, the Shahar Mufti of Varanasi came immediately to the support 
of the head priest of the Sumkut Mochin Temple. And old patterns of living together, of business and commerce, pilgrimage and tourism, seem to hold steady throughout the explosions. Indeed, if we were to study the responses to terrible episodes of communal violence in the past 15 years in India, whether in Ayodhya or in Gujarat, we'd find a landscape of hundreds of countervailing civic groups, NGOs, peace brigades, constructed across lines of difference. And I would contend that imperative as it is to see clearly the raw facts of neighbor turning on neighbor in violence, it is also equally imperative to understand and to study the deep resistances to this cycle of violence and the active alliance of Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, and even arch-secularists to prevent it. This bridging public conscious consciousness with its many manifestations deserves to be studied with all the energy and focus that some scholars bring to the study of religious violence. In addition to the multitude of knots and fibers and nets that stretch through India connecting people and communities at the local level, there are Hindu public thinkers and activists who speak out of the Hindu tradition, although few of them are very well known. Many take their inspiration from a Gandhian heritage. And among them, one person I will lift up today is Swami Agnivesh, a Swami, a religious leader who comes out of the Arya Samaj movement that began in the late 19th century. Agnivesh is a tall, striking man who wears the saffron robes of a sannyasi, a world renouncer. But this renunciation and garb in no way singles his, signals his retirement from the world, but rather his activist involvement with a world working for the liberation of the oppressed. Like Gandhi, he adopted a kind of this-worldly asceticism. And though he uses more visible garb of the sannyasi than Gandhi, uh, Gandhi's simple dhoti, he says of this, there are five million swamis and most of them are parasites. <laughs> they live on the alms and labor of others and on the poor. They do not work on behalf of others. Their renunciation is a form of escapism, he puts it bluntly. But my saffron garb is my uniform for social spiritual action, a call to battle on behalf of the oppressed. His work is focused on the social ills that plague the conscience of all religious people in India, the persistence of bonded labor and child labor, the dignity and equality of women and the problem of female feticide, the persistence of casteism and discrimination, consumerism and the cultural invasion of what he calls neo-colonial economic institutions, Western industry, Western banking, and the troublemaking exclusivist Christian, Muslim, and Hindu movements. How many God-given infallible books are there being peddled in the world, he says? What have we done in the name of religion? For centuries, we've been at each other's throats in the name of gods, prophets, and saviors. We're responsible for the greatest bloodshed, for the most barbaric human behavior that human beings have historically committed. A true dialogue can only happen, he says, if we are willing to give up the notion that we alone exclusively possess the idea, the only truth meant for all humanity, here and now and forever. Looking at the strident religious chauvinism of the times, he sees too much of religion in its traditional, sometimes ritual and dogmatic forms, and too little of the life-giving energy he calls spirituality. Religious communities are out there competing for votes, for resources, for power, the call of the times, he says, is centripetal to pull religions together, but religions in their attitude to each other are centrifugal. They pull away from each other. And he insists that all of us, whether uh, South Asian of any religious background, rethink the model of conflict and competition in shaping religious identities. If the spiritual quest takes us on an inward pilgrimage, it also must take us into the world with the problems that cry out for attention. And this is the kind of pilgrimage that Swami Agnivesh undertakes, gathering the devout from many traditions. When I started working for the poor, he said, I found friends in other traditions. I found a whole new community of people cutting across religions, actively involved to support me. He calls his work social spirituality or applied spirituality. And he uses that metaphor of pilgrimage, a journey undertaken 
with people of all faiths toward the goal of social justice. And it's more than a metaphorical journey. His public witness is important. Let me give you some examples. In 1987, it was an 18-day pilgrimage, a padyatra, a foot journey from Delhi to Devrala in Rajasthan, where a 17-year-old girl, Rup Kanwar, had died on the funeral pyre of her husband. Outrage at both the sati and the glorifications of it brought Agnivesh with over 100 religious leaders to protest this practice and the ill treatment of women that would still permit women bur uh, widow burning in the 20th century. In 1992, it was a pilgrimage from Delhi to Ayodhya to protest the destruction of that mosque and uh, the building or the plan to build a Hindu temple on the site. In 1999, it was a pilgrimage of 51 people of many faiths to Manoharpur in Arissa, where a Christian pastor and social activist, Graham Staines, and his two young sons were killed. In 2003, it was a journey with Christians, Muslims, and Hindus to Ahmedabad to investigate the terrible communal violence that had torn Gujarat apart. In his frequent contributions to the editorial pages of the Times of India, uh, Swami Agnivesh usually writes with an Anglican priest, Valsam Tampu, of St. Stephen's College in Delhi. And you can read those together in some of the books that they have jointly authored. Now, let me turn to some Buddhists who have also raised their voices to interpret our world of difference and division. There's no one better known in the world of spiritual leadership in the 21st century than the Dalai Lama. In 2005, the BBC took a poll of some 15,000 people, I think mostly in Britain, to elect a world government. Who should run the world, they asked. And His Holiness the Dalai Lama was third on the list, uh, after Bill Clinton and Nelson Mandela, <laughs> then the Dalai Lama. And then it went on to include Bill Gates and Noam Chomsky and Desmond Tutu, and this was before Barack Obama, so he didn't make the list. But there's no question that the Dalai Lama is one of the most recognized and beloved spiritual leaders in the world. Wherever he goes, he draws huge crowds to very unlikely venues like Madison Square Garden in New York or the House of Parliament here in Edinburgh or a big high school football stadium in uh, Idaho. He has a kind of recognized leadership worldwide, also within the Buddhist world. There are, of course, international Buddhist organizations, a World Buddhist Forum, a World Buddhist Organization, but still, the Buddhist world really has no official leadership. It is so diverse, as diverse as the cultures into which it has moved and invariably transformed from India to China, Japan, Korea, Southeast Asia, and more recently to the United States and Europe. There are other individual leaders who have a considerable following within their own community and also a global reach. I think, for example, of the venerable master Sin Yung of the Fokuang Buddhist movement, often called Buddhist humanism, that's based in Taiwan, but truly is global today. It's a movement in which women are ordained into the monastic orders, and where these women are the mainstay of some of its huge temples, like the Shilai Temple in Hacienda Heights, California, uh, the largest Buddhist temple in the Western Hemisphere. Very interesting movement. I also think of Daisaku Ikeda, the head of the Soka Gakkai International, Japanese in origin, but also with a global reach. In a longer presentation, we'd want to look at these kinds of new, relatively new global Buddhist movements. However, for many reasons, and not the least of which is his personal bearing and charisma, the Dalai Lama is the most deeply and widely acknowledged Buddhist leader in the world. He is one whom scientists and scholars and senators alike refer to as His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. Despite and perhaps because of his self-effacing manner, his humor, his insistence that he is a simple Buddhist monk, not the reincarnation of Avalokiteshvara, a form of the Buddha, that it's that simplicity, very much like Gandhi's simplicity, that people recognize and in him recognize the quality of what they readily call holiness. His is a tradition that on the whole does not have much to do with God or the gods. These words don't convey any weight or symbolic freight. And yet there is depth here, profound depth. 
So if we ask the Dalai Lama to help us with the difficult question of religious difference and religious conflict that perplex us in the age of pluralism, what are we likely to hear from him? First, we would certainly hear that the Tibetan people have been part of the global migrations of the end of the 20th century, in this case as refugees. It was 1959 when the Chinese moved heavily into Tibet. The Tibetans who resisted the repressive communist regime were forced to flee from their high Himalayan plateau. The Dalai Lama was only 24 when he made his escape from Lhasa incognito over the mountains and into exile in India where he set up a temporary, well, it not so temporary now after 50 years, government of Tibet in exile. More than 80,000, now 100,000 people followed him into exile in Nepal, India, places like the UK and the US as well. He describes himself then as a, quote, newcomer to the modern world. He brought with him a deep training in Mahayana Buddhist philosophy, and the Dalai Lama brought that mind, that trained mind, to many of the challenges of the modern world. Over the decades, he's entered into dialogue with Western monastics, like the Trappist Thomas Merton, but also with scientists, environmentalists, and medical researchers, with whom he shares a well-honed analytic bent because of his philosophical training. For me, Buddhism is the most precious path, he says, but that does not mean I believe it to be the best religion for everyone any more than I believe it is necessary for everyone to be a religious believer. All the great world's religions are, as he puts it, directed toward helping human beings achieve lasting happiness. It is good that there are many religions and philosophies, as he puts it, because human beings have such a variety of mental dispositions. What is really important, however, are not the religions, but spirituality, the cultivation of qualities of the human spirit, love, compassion, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, contentment, a sense of responsibility, and a sense of harmony. These are what, are, what is essential to the religious life and to the moral and ethical life. And they are not the exclusive possession of people who identify with one religion or other or with any religion at all. I sometimes say, he wrote, that religion is something we can perhaps do without. What we cannot do without are these basic spiritual qualities. This then gives us quite a different perspective on the streams of faith that we call the religions. It's not the religions themselves that are important, not at all, but these spiritual qualities. Granted, religious practices and religious communities are often the best place to cultivate these qualities of the spirit, but one must not get attached to the practices, the communities, the beliefs, the religions, they are vehicles and not ends. When the Dalai Lama wrote Ethics for a New Millennium, he called for what he described as a spiritual revolution. And what he meant was, quote, a radical reorientation away from our habitual preoccupation with ourselves. It is a call to turn toward the wider community of beings with whom we're connected, and a call for conduct which recognizes others' interests alongside our own. It's an ethical revolution that depends upon our being able to place ourselves in the position of the other. It is what we mentioned yesterday toward the end, that light recoil upon ourselves, our ideas, our beliefs, our identity, that stutter in one's own faith, that catch or disruption that enables us to take stock of the, receptiv of the subjectivity of another, of the subjectivity of another person and a person of another faith. In Ethics for a New Millennium, he is writing for all of us. He does not use specifically religious language, let alone Buddhist philosophical language. He does, however, employ a Buddhist perspective that we might find quite helpful as we navigate the swift currents and turbulence of life on planet Earth today. Let me try to put it simply. Our tendency is to look at events, phenomena, news stories, and sound bites in isolation. But of course, to really understand them, we have to see them in relation to one another 
and to a wider totality. Everything has a cause. Like a complex series of causes, usually. Everything, from the London bombings, to the photographs in Abu Ghraib prison, to the death of a beloved parent, to the creation of a fine violin. And everything also becomes the cause of other things, as people experience the complex effects of the London bombings, the photographs of Abu Ghraib, the emotional impact of a parent's death, or the sound and timbre of a fine violin. We know this. Nothing stands isolated, independent. The whole and the part, the parent and the child, the music and the instrument, the bomb and its maker, are inextricably related. And their relatedness, Buddhists call interdependent causation, or dependent co-arising, or dependent co-origination. It's translated in lots of ways. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh calls it interbeing. The Sanskrit term pratitya samutpada, dependent origination. This is not a belief or a dogma of Buddhism, but rather a clear observation about life, how things are. There's much in Buddhist practice that has contributed to the rich cultures of Asia and increasingly the West, but if we focus only on this one thorny issue of religious diversity and the engagements that we call pluralism, perhaps this is the most critical and key perspective, that everything is related. All of us, everything is composite. It is made up of other things. The very things to which we ascribe solidity in the world are ever-changing, and this includes the streams of life and practice we call our religions. We give them names as if they were nouns and fixities. We call them Christianity and Buddhism, but they did not come from nowhere, and they are different every morning. And by the way, the same goes for the little pilot of our own ship of human experience that we call ourselves. So what does the world look like to the Dalai Lama seen in this perspective? Here's a glimpse of the Dalai Lama he gives us as he stood prayerfully at Auschwitz, at those ev ovens at the end of that railway. He recalled, and I quote, what struck me hardest was the realization that these devices had been built with the care and attention of talented workmen. I could almost see the engineers at their drawing boards carefully planning the shape of the combustion chambers and calculating the size of the chimneys, their height and breadth. I thought of the craftsmen who brought this design to fruition. Then it occurred to me that this is precisely what modern day weapons designers and manufacturers are all about. They too are about devising the means to destroy, if not millions, of their fellow human beings. It is we he writes, it is we who fabricate our weapons and gas chambers. War may be a three-letter noun, but it does not take place independent of the thousands of individuals who create it. Neither does peace. So too are empires, the British Empire, the USSR, the US. So too are great institutions, the Vatican, the London Symphony, General Motors. These are composite creations of minds and attention. And so too the very habits of our mind and heart. We human beings cultivate our propensity to anger or our propensity to revenge, and we practice it over and over. We're also capable of cultivating our ability to love, to forgive, our propensity for patience, tolerance, and compassion, those spiritual qualities. Long, long before Durkheim thought about the social construction of religious ideas, long before prominent sociologists spoke of the social construction of reality, long before we talked about the kind of analysis that came to be called deconstructionism, the Buddha spoke about the dependent origination, the composite and changing reality of those seemingly stable things we call the world. Interdependence, then, is not a theory about reality, but an analysis, an observation about how things work. And it is a perspective that persistently sees the webs of relationships that we call reality, including ourselves and including our religions. Ultimately, we'd have to say the Dalai Lama is not too concerned with the diversity of religions. Of course, they'll be different. At their best, they will support the cultivation of those qualities of spirituality that are essential for human flourishing. But like medicine, 
the Dalai Lama would say that a religion is not good or helpful on its own. It requires that we use it in order to understand and appreciate its efficacy. It requires our human agency. Come and see, said the Buddha. Ehi pasika. Come and see. Use it. Take the recommended dose and see for yourself. Perhaps the stillness of breath-centered Buddhist meditation enables one to see deep into the habits of mind and heart that sustain or hinder the qualities of the spirit. Or perhaps the soaring choirs of St. Giles and the community of faith that lifts the spirit there helps to cultivate the spiritual qualities essential for life. The spiritual revolution the Dalai Lama calls for then is that radical reorientation away from our habitual preoccupation with ourselves, to recognize others' interests alongside our own. On September 12, 2001, the Dalai Lama wrote a brief but powerful letter to President Bush, expressing his shock of the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, offering condolences and solidarity on behalf of the Tibetan people. And he expressed confidence in the resilience and courage of the American people. He closed with these words. It may seem presumptuous on my part, but personally I believe we need to think seriously whether a violent reaction is the right thing to do and in the greater interest of the nation and the people in the long run. I believe violence will only increase the cycle of violence. But how do we deal with hatred and anger, which are often the root causes of such senseless violence? This is a very difficult question, especially when it concerns a nation, and we have certain fixed ideas of how to deal with such attacks. I am sure you will make the right decision. Yours sincerely, Tenzin Gyatso, the Dalai Lama. Now, more briefly, another of the global voices of Buddhism that may have some wisdom to offer in this world of religious diversity and turbulence is that of Thich Nhat Hanh. He, too, comes from the crucible of testing in the fires of 20th century political violence. He, too, is a refugee of sorts. He was a young monk during the Vietnam War, and he saw, I saw, the world saw, the unforgettable image of a Buddhist monk seated in the serenity of meditation aflame with fire. His name was Thich Quan Duc, one of the many Buddhist monks who, like Thich Nhat Hanh, opposed both the communist regime of North Vietnam and the Diem regime of the South in what was essentially an escalating war with incalculable suffering to the people of Vietnam. Thich Quang Duc, prepared by years of Buddhist monastic training, walked calmly to the center of the main intersection in Hue, poured gasoline over his body, sat down in a meditative posture and set himself ablaze. For me, as for many in the world, that photo was a moment of awakening. Which side was he on? No side, the people's side. About that time, Thich Nhat Hanh wrote a book sounding the voice of Buddhist resistance to this war with no winners, intended largely for an American leadership. It was called Lotus in a Sea of Fire. And it was the first book on Buddhism that I ever read. In the late 1960s, Thich Nhat Hanh came to the US to speak about the war, sponsored by the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and it was the beginning of what's now been more than four decades of his teaching in America and Europe. Not until two years ago was he able to return to Vietnam. We wanted reconciliation, he said. We did not want a victory. The communists killed us because they suspected that we were working with the Americans. And the anti-communists killed us because they thought we were with the communists. Reconciliation is to understand both sides, to describe the suffering of both sides. And there's much here that reminds us of Gandhi, that there's usually no victory in winning a violent conflict, for when all is said and done, the enemy is vanquished, and one still has an enemy, only a vanquished and angry one. Throughout his life, Thich Nhat Hanh developed this clear perspective on a world divided by the polarizations created by religion and ideology by our notions of who we are. In Vietnam, there were French Catholic missionaries there to evangelize that eventually included the Catholic Archbishop of Vietnam and his brother, President Dien. 
And there were communists and the Viet Cong there to liberate with their own ideology. But a vast majority of the people, in the meantime, suffered in the throes of battle. Both sides saw Buddhist monks and nuns as collaborators with the other side. And Thich Nhat Hanh worked for reconciliation, reaching out to both sides, but was forced into exile, though he ultimately participated in the Paris peace talks at the so-called end of the war. For decades, he made his primary residence, and still does, at Plum Village in the south of France. When he returned to Vietnam after more than three decades, he said, for the last 30 years, a number of people in Vietnam and elsewhere continue to blame me for being too close to the Christians and the communists. They just want me to be close to the Buddhists and the anti-communists. I've tried to remind them that man is not our enemy. My practice is to be able to embrace both the communists and the Christians because I cannot just embrace the Buddhists and the anti-communists. Narrowness, fanaticism, prejudice are found on both sides. The responsibility of the Buddhist practitioner is to help people unite and untie that narrowness, that prejudice, that fanaticism, to help them become understanding, tolerant, and compassion, compassionate, and not just pick up a gun and destroy. Most of Thich Nhat Hanh's interreligious work has been in relation to Christians, beginning with those in the US who were involved in peace work during the Vietnam War. Christianity as a religion had given him a pretty negative impression since it was largely carried through missionaries in Vietnam who had been deprecatory of Buddhism. It was only later, he wrote, through friendship with Christian men and women who truly embody the spirit of understanding and compassion of Jesus that I've been able to touch the depth of Christianity. The moment I met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he said, I knew I was in the presence of a holy person. Not just his good work, but his very being was a source of great inspiration for me. And conversely, in the past two decades, for many American Vietnam War veterans, Thich Nhat Hanh has been that holy person who represents to many of them people they had seen only as enemies during the trauma of war. In the retreats that Thich Nhat Hanh offers, especially for Vietnam vets, these aging men have often wept as they enter deeply into reconciling and forgiving meditation. On the altar of my hermitage in France, he writes, are images of Buddha and Jesus. And every time I light incense, I touch both of them as my spiritual ancestors. I can do this because of contact with these real Christians. When you touch someone who authentically represents a tradition, you not only touch his or her tradition, you also touch your own. We'll return to Thich Nhat Hanh briefly on Thursday. For today, it's important to have glimpsed another spiritual leader whose life and practice speaks to a world of difference and conflict with profound insight and a gentle voice. And I want to close with mention of two other religious traditions of India that provide unique perspectives on the problematic of pluralism. First, the ancient Jain tradition with its uh, distinctive Anekantavada philosophy. I'll say more about that. In India, sages and philosophers held many metaphysical views and were in constant dialogue and argument with one another. And it might interest you to know that in such philosophical debates, one was constrained by an important rule, that to represent the position of the other side with such accuracy that those on the other side could say yes to it, that was the precondition for then saying what you thought and picking it apart. But there can be no misrepresentation of the other to make one's own position look stronger. And central among the positions Jane, Jane's argued was the position referred to as anekantavada, translated literally meaning no one perspectivism, or in other words, the multiplicity and relativity of views. Jane's rejected the either or of certain forms of logic and of absolutist thinking, instead taking the relativist stand that for every question, there are many right answers, and that truth can be expressed in a number of different ways, depending upon the angle from which it's viewed. A well-known story has its origin with the Jains. 
and it helps to illustrate this point. Five blind men have never seen an elephant. One day an elephant is brought to the village and the five approach it, attempt to describe it. One who is standing by the trunk describes it as a thick branch of a tree. The man who feels the tail disagrees, insisting it's rather like a rope. The man who touches the side in turn submits that the elephant is really like a great sort of hairy wall. But the man at the elephant's leg said it's like a pillar. And the man who gets hold of the ear describes it as a huge fan. Luckily, a sixth man sighted is nearby to mitigate the dispute and proclaims that in fact all of them are right, but only partially right. An accurate description must combine all of their views and a complete understanding of truth requires the consideration and acceptance of a variety of viewpoints. And finally, a word about Sikhism, the world's most recent religious tradition in one sense, having emerged only 500 years ago, following the spiritual and social teachings of Guru Nanak. The songs of Nanak and the other gurus of the tradition proclaim the divine name of God, the liberating power of singing and of devotion to the name, the kinship of all people, and the equality of men and women. Sikhism is not a proselytizing religion, though many who come to the Gurdwara are drawn by its warmth and its hospitality. For our discussion here, however, I would emphasize its ritualization of the complete social equality of people. Commensality, eating together, which marked a departure from the social separatism of much of Hindu society, where there was and remains, for some, a taboo against eating with those outside one's caste group. Rules for the sharing of food in Hindu society are many and complex. But the Sikh gurus explicitly rejected this complexity, asking that all Sikhs and all visitors to the Sikh Gurdwara partake of common food, provided daily, and in the company of one another. This langar, the common meal, thus expresses a common table of hospitality and symbolizes a Sikh's personal rejection of prejudice. One of the most impressive things to those of you who visit a Sikh Gurdwara, and if you haven't, you should visit the one here in Edinburgh, are these large industrial-sized kitchens and the ways in which the community joins in preparing the langar. They've developed commensality to a high art, and at the Parliament of the World's Religions in Barcelona in 2004, it was the Sikh community of Birmingham that set up huge tents and tent kitchens serving langar for 5,000 people a day for a week, and so too in 2007 when the Sikhs of Leeds prepared langar for thousands of people during the celebration of the 800th anniversary of the city of Leeds. So the Jain commitment to intellectual and epistemological humility and the Sikh commitment to social equality and belonging, these together constitute valuable religious contributions to the problematic of diversity in the age of pluralism. Now to return to that theme of my first lecture, the currents of fast-moving globalization have made all of these traditions, these long dynamic traditions of Asia, part of the multi-religious environment of the West. At first, we spoke of them as new religious movements, new truly only to us. And now Hindus and Sikhs, Jains and Buddhists contribute their perspectives to the communities and cultures of Europe and North America. The pluralism has become a vast pluralism. And as I will speak of on Thursday and on the final lecture, it has become a pluralism not only without in our cities and towns and in our world, but also within, in the inner geography of ourselves. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Questions are open now, if you will please raise your hand over here. Thank you very much for the lecture series. Our lectures are erudite and elegant, and they're available and uh, well illustrated. I'd like to make a comment rather than a question, if that's in order. Uh, in my garden, I have a stone a sundial, 
and on the base is an inscription, I count only the sunny days. And I wonder if your lectures have counted mainly the sunny aspects of pluralism, and that we have to also have a place for the cloudy days and the gathering storm. My problem with the lectures is the title, The Age of Pluralism. It seems to me to be an idealist concept, uh, yet another in a long list of idealist concepts, uh, describing the social history as if the concepts arising from nowhere just followed one another. And I would prefer if pluralism could be viewed through a materialist view of history, in which religious pluralism is not viewed as a religious issue at all, but is in fact constructed from cultural and economic factors from a movement that might be described as Western liberal democracy, which began in the 18th century, climaxed in the 20th, is now in retreat and probably will not survive the 21st century. Um, I therefore prefer the materialist uh, reading of uh, history, which encourages us to uh, make uh, a critical analysis uh, of uh, pluralism rather than the idealist one, which I think encourages us to be selective, uh, descriptive, and illustrative. Thank you. I'd like to respond to that. Um, first, let me talk about the sunny days part, which I have tried to indicate a few, uh, in a few places in these lectures, which is that there, there is quite a lot of scholarship these days about the ways in which the um, sort of so-called clash of civilizations, and even if you're not interested in that sort of cosmic view of things, and its minor and regional forms of, uh, of violence um, have religious roots and uh, socio-cultural economic roots as well. And I think it's fairly well studied how, how religious violence has, uh, has gathered the, in the gathering storms of the 20th century. I think what we don't know and what I'm trying to point toward is what else is happening. And I think the extent to which it's happening on the ground in many parts of the world, understudied and under uh, explored, is probably as prognostic for our future as the gathering storms of cloudy days and violence. I do think that there's a kind of materialist uh, view of history that sees religious pluralism as simply what has emerged from our cultures over time, not uh, something created by God or anything of that sort, but something that you know, is simply a cultural fact of our histories. And uh, that even being the case, people who are religious in their various communities or prejudice in their various communities have to contend with this fact of difference. And it is a threatening thing for many people. It also is uh, an exciting thing for other people. But it is something that, that has spiritual resonance whether or not you see it as having spiritual origins. Now, one of the things that people do within religious communities, and that's why I've tried to represent those voices, whether it's Christian or Muslim or Jewish, for example, is to understand from their own religious perspective and in their own language what it is that, uh, how it is they might understand religious pluralism. And I think we need to do that because many people live within those religious languages and religiously constructed worlds. Uh, so it matters how Muslims or Christians view the diversity of humankind. Is it something that's God-given, that's created, and therefore it's our responsibility to compete in righteousness or to understand ways of the, the stranger in the ways in which are indicated in uh, the Gospels, for example. So there, there's religious language at work in our world, whether it's our language or not. It is the language of many people in the Christian world, many people in the Muslim world. 
So I think it's important to take uh, stock of that religious language as well, because that is language of interpretation. But I thank you for that question. Good. Here. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I want to ask you a question about uh, the, you have mentioned that all the religions, when facing the injustice, they can cooperate, can work together and fight for the social justice. Sometimes they can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I agree that. Yeah, but, but also you mentioned that all the religions are truth and all the religions are, are imperfect. And you mentioned the examples of the uh, elephant. And you, you seem to mean that all the religions can combine together as a whole religion and this kind of no, that. no, I don't think we're going to create one elephant out of all the religions, if that's a question. I don't think so. <laughs> mm -mm. Is it, but it, I don't think that's your question. Is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I mean, there certainly are ways in which people and movements that one can identify across Asia that have brought people of various religious traditions together around justice issues. Um, and I think not only of Gandhian movements in India or the kinds of things I spoke of that Swami Agnivesh is working on, but I think also of someone like Chandra Muzaffar in Malaysia who has a group called the International Society for a Just World that consists not only of Malaysian Muslims and Christians and Hindus and others, but sort of co-workers and co-conspirators across the world. People like Sulak Shivaraksha who is a Thai Buddhist activist. So there, you know, the, the idea of coming together around issues of social justice is not something that we see only in kind of the modern West where it's become fairly common, but also among religious communities in Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Tal. Thank you very much for your excellent lecture. That my question is, uh, in your opinion, uh, if the debate is a part of UK or US, what the government will do when they face the Dalai Lama's independent or democracy? Thanks a lot. This is a great question. I think our governments are, uh, uh, you know, ought to uh, think very clearly about the role of the international religious community, the in, sorry, the international community of the United Nations, and how it is that, um, that in this particular instance, the world seems to have turned away in some ways. I am not very happy with my own government in this regard. I'm not very happy with my own university in this regard that has hosted the Dalai Lama on any number of occasions. Uh, including just this past week, and uh, planted a tree with the Dalai Lama, but not gone so far as to give him an honorary degree, which is certainly something that I think would be appropriate. So I do think that our governments have lacked courage on this, uh, as on other, a couple of other uh, major issues that we could name. And the Dalai Lama himself is fairly... Um, is very guarded. Uh, someone asked him, I believe in the session here in Edinburgh, uh, a child asked him, why did the Chinese invade Tibet? And he thought about it for a while and said, I think that's a question you should ask the Chinese government. Um, so he is trying to be... Uh, to be reconciling, you might say. But I think that he needs some very much stronger allies in the world, including uh, the governments of the West. Thank you for that question. Uh, one final question here. Huh? Okay. Hi. Um, I um, just um, like to thank the man over there for his question. Um, because um, I, I, I do feel, in a way, that you're only talking about the cuddly 
um, except to boast about polarized versions of religion. Um, if we look, if we look down the history of religion and um, even within their scriptures, violence is hardwired into these religions. Um, I mean, in the Old Testament, you have um, Elijah smashing the um, priests of Ahab. Um, in the Quran, you have the conquest of Mecca after Muhammad was rejected by the churches and synagogues there. Um, so, uh, and um, most of us follow religions we do because our ancestors were probably forced into these religions. Uh, most of the Americas are Christian because of Spanish colonialism. Um, Scotland became Christian probably because of something similar. I certainly know in Norway that um, part of the Christianization process involved uh, drowning the um, shamans. Um, so we're, we're basically just um, going for the aspects that we find nice and that we can't accept that, uh, you, you know, there is this ugly aspect there. Um, and uh, e even with Gandhi, I've heard some um, quotes from Gandhi, um, mostly from a book called The Gandhi Nobody Knows, and I don't know how accurate or reliable this is, but um, one of them was Gandhi um, speaking about the Holocaust, Holocaust saying that uh, the Jews got what they deserved, because basically they had some form of bad karma. Um, and I've heard similar quotes about mad cow disease because that um, Europeans eat beef, so that offends Shiva. Um, the Tibetan tragedy again, it's up some kind of divine judgment. Um, the Indian Ocean tsunami, um, I've seen as many explanations for that as there are religions. Um, most of them involve some kind of punishment for some action or other that some religion does. I don't, I don't think that we can sort of just say, oh, spirituality is some kind of um, cozy thing that we, we just uh, remain contemplative. It, it, uh, violence is integral to most religions. That's a great, uh, a, a great summation of a, a long history, sir. Uh, and it is, you know, it's true. All of our religious traditions have very, very ugly chapters, have a lot of violence uh, as part of them, and all of them are human creations. They are all part of what we human beings have managed to interpret and reinterpret, claim and reclaim, reject over time. And they're all dynamic. Religious traditions, religion, whatever you mean by that word, is not something that's just dropped from heaven, but is a dynamic and ever-changing, ever-moving stream, new, every morning. Now, the question is, what do we do in uh, the early 21st century with this religious heritage? And uh, it has always been in the process of jettisoning, jettisoning certain things and reclaiming other things. And that really is the task that falls to us today. How are we going to think about how to live not only with our own co-religionists, but with people we don't share uh, a religious or cultural world with? Um, and, you know, that is a question. It doesn't matter whether you're even religious or not. You have to deal with that question because there are a lot of people who are. And so it, the issue of continually working with the traditions that we have to mine the things that are most valuable and that have been most sustaining for human life and growth and well-being over time is something that's well worth doing. And uh, we can decide that we'll be trapped in the past and continue beating ourselves for the uh, violence of the traditions from which we come. Or we can actually decide that the good parts of these traditions are things that we will uh, cherish and run with and continue to, uh, to enhance. And so, you know, my view of this is not that these are just the cuddly sides of religion. Some of them are really the hard sides of religion. The way the Dalai Lama talks is not easy. I mean, he, you know, he recognizes straight on that what we do for the most part is practice the chords of ways of being human that reinforce the violence, reinforce the hatred, reinforce the fear, reinforce the anger uh, that are at the seed of most of the things that 
uh, we human beings do that are destructive. That's our doing. So in order to decide to cultivate the spiritual qualities that he sees as essential in the ethics for a new millennium, that's going to take work. Continually putting oneself in the position of those alongside of whom one lives. Continually cultivating patience and generosity and compassion. It sounds sort of cuddly, but you know, the future really depends on this. And to some extent, I, I'm sympathetic with the things that the, the 138 Muslim clerics wrote to the Christian world. This is, a, this is not an easy matter, and it's an urgent matter. We'll blow ourselves up. Between Christians and Muslims, we account for well over uh, half of the world's people. And we need to figure out ways of drawing upon the depths of our tradition in the most positive and central ways in order to survive. So when I say it's the age of pluralism, I'm not saying that in some sort of idealistic sense. I'm saying that because this is an age in which we have to contend with these issues, uh, issues of religious difference within and without. And we have to contend with them whether we're religious or not, whether we like it or not, really and whether we accept it or not. These are the, the issues of contention of the age. And uh, you know, I am one of those people who wants us to contend with them in a way in which is positive and creative, because I think real pluralism is a creation and uh, one that we still have to bring into being. Sorry for that little mini lecture at the end, but anyway, thank you. We have just one, I presume, short lecture. <laughs> Hiya. Um, I like the way that you, you say that we, ca we can't really consider things in isolation, that we have to conceive things in their necessary um, interrelationship within the whole. But then I, I wonder how you manage to reconcile that with this, this kind of separation that you've posed between spirituality and religion, in the sense that maybe spirit, the, the kind of religion element is the kind of unnecessary social manifestation and the, the division between what seems like mm -hmm. some sort of core that you're posing within the sort of spirituality or the ethical dimension of the religion. And I worry that maybe you're kind of essentializing that there and mm -hmm. overriding the natural diversity of the self social manifestations of that belief. I just wonder how you reconcile that. Well, it's actually the distinction that the Dalai Lama makes here, which is, you know, we don't necessarily need to be too worried about the things that we call the religions. The good thing about most of the religions is that they are the communities and forms of practice that enable us to cultivate these spiritual qualities. But it's really the spiritual and moral qualities of compassion and generosity and patience and love, things that are sustaining for human beings, those are the things that are really important. Most people find that they can cultivate them best within the context of a community of faith that we call the religions. But those are not necessarily the only places those things can be cultivated. He's not, you know, there are lots of different kinds of religions. You can do this within being a Muslim or being a Buddhist or being a Hindu or being a Christian or being someone who isn't really interested in religion as finds all of them a little bit um, uh, alienating. And there are certainly a lot of people like that today. But the important thing is the cultivation of those ethical qualities. The important thing is not the vehicle through which you cultivate them. And you know, there's a lot of talk about this in the Buddhist tradition. You know, you don't need to. It's good to have a raft to get across the river, but you don't necessarily need to have that, take that raft and carry it with you once you get to the other shore. Um, that kind of metaphor. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I still don't understand how you how you can separate them. I don't understand how you can separate the the practical dimension from the from the belief here. I don't know how you can do away with. Um, social manifestation of belief, but then saying that 
everything should be considered in its whole and everything has a place within that whole. Well, it's it not that, really he, that the Dalai Lama wants to do away with the religions, to be sure. It's just that the He's religions in, are not the important though. thing. You know, the, 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 the important thing in his perspective, and I'm trying to represent his perspective here. That's hard, actually. Uh, the important thing is the cultivation of these qualities of ethics and morality. The important thing is the cultivation of love and compassion. Let's just take two of them. Um, the, it is not so much whether you are a Buddhist or a Christian or a Muslim. All of those traditions are good if they sustain that kind of uh, practice and cultivation of spiritual qualities. But you know, it's not that the religions themselves are, are what is good. What is good about them is the, the ability of those to, to um, enable you to grow. I mean, uh, Christianity is just, in one sense, a word. Uh, it's so is Buddhism. It covers a lot of things. It's a noun. It's um, it's like a medicine, as he puts it. Uh, it's it's good for you if you take it, if you actually enter into it and put it on and try it on and use it in in a way that is healing. It's not just sort of a good thing in itself. Now may I now yield the floor to uh, the principal, uh, Sir Timothy O'Shea, and ask him to give the vote of thanks. And I've been instructed to give you this microphone as well. Good evening. Um, as, as well as being principal of the university, I'm also um, the chair of the Gifford Committee, uh, so I'd like to make a couple of remarks on the university and the Gifford Committees um, uh, for them. Um, the Gifford Committee really takes the um, tradition of the, the, the entire series very, very ser seriously indeed. Um, it's the Gifford series as a whole has really made uh, very important contributions to a, a whole diversity of humanity's thought. Uh, we think, uh, we're very aware of, the, as it were, the burden of, our, of, of the massive success of the, the Gifford Lectures. So we think very hard and we really focus on who we consider to be, having taken advice, uh, the most important and influential scholars. Uh, and we're really, as a university, very privileged because as in the case of Professor Eck, uh, very often our prayers are answered and these extremely uh, important and influential people then come and we uh, negotiate with them to then talk on, on really, really the most uh, challenging subjects, but uh, in doing that, I'm very aware, and I really want to thank Professor Eck, that given the sort of people we target, like ourselves, like herself, the demands on them for time, for speaking, for writing, for public presentation, are immense. So it is a tremendous gift uh, <clears throat> to the University of Edinburgh and its community, but also to the intellectual life of Scotland and broader that we we are in the presence of. And, uh, I really want to obviously express my appreciation for the five lectures that have been the one that's to be, my appreciation to the audience. Uh, but most of all, on behalf of the university and the Gifford Committee, I want to express my appreciation for the great generosity that Professor Eck has shown us and the great respect to the Gifford tradition by being present, by being involved in so many ways. So please join with me in thanking her. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.